A portion was divided off at one end by a curtain, behind which was his bed, the outer part being furnished as a homely sitting-room. At first he lived up above entirely, reading a good deal, and strumming upon an old harp, which he had bought at a sale, saying, when in a bitter humour, that he might have to get his living by it in the streets some day. But he soon preferred to read human nature by taking his meals downstairs in the general dining-kitchen, with the dairyman and his wife, and the maids and men, who altogether formed a lively assembly, for though but few milking-hands slept in the house, several joined the family at meals. The longer Clare resided here, the less objection had he to his company, and the more did he like to share quarters with them in common. Much to his surprise, he took indeed a real delight in their companionship. The conventional farm-folk of his imagination, personified by the pitiable dummy known as Hodge, were obliterated after a few days' residence. At close quarters no Hodge was to be seen. At first, it is true, when Clare's intelligence was fresh from a contrasting society, these friends with whom he now hobnobbed seemed a little strange. Sitting down as a level member of the dairyman's household seemed at the outset an undignified proceeding. The ideas, the modes, the surroundings appeared retrogressive and unmeaning. But with living on there day after day, the acute sojourner became conscious of a new aspect in the spectacle. Without any objective change whatever, variety had taken the place of monotonousness. His host and his host's household, his men and his maids, as they became intimately known to Clare, began to differentiate themselves as in a chemical process. The thought of Pascal's was brought home to him. On trouve qu'il y a plus d'hommes originaux. Les gens du commun ne trouvent pas de différence entre les hommes. The typical and unvarying Hodge ceased to exist. He had been disintegrated into a number of varied fellow creatures, beings of many minds, beings infinite in difference, some happy, many serene, a few depressed one here and one there bright, even to genius, some stupid, others wanton, others austere, some mutely Miltonic, some poetically Cromwellian, into men who had private views of each other as he had of his friends, who could applaud or condemn each other, amuse or sadden themselves by the contemplation of each other's foibles or vices men every one of whom walked in his own individual way the road to dusty death. Unexpectedly he began to like the outdoor life for its own sake, and for what it brought, apart from its bearing on his own proposed career. Considering his position, he had become wonderfully free from the chronic melancholy which is taking hold of the civilized races with the decline of belief in a beneficent power. For the first time of late years he could read as his musings inclined him, without any eye to cramming for a profession, since the few farming handbooks which he deemed it desirable to master occupied him but little time. He grew away from old associations, and saw something new in life and humanity. Secondarily, he made close acquaintance with a phenomena which he had known before but darkly the seasons in their moods, morning and evening, night and noon, winds in their different tempers, trees, waters, and mists, shade and silence, and the voices of inanimate things. The early mornings were still sufficiently cool to render a fire acceptable in the large room wherein they breakfasted, and, by Mrs. Crick's orders, who held that he was too genteel to mess at their table, it was Angel Clare's custom to sit in the yawning chimney-corner during his meal, his cup and saucer and plate being placed on a hinged flap at his elbow. The light from the long, wide, mullioned window opposite shone in upon this nook, and assisted by a secondary light of cold blue quality which shone down the chimney, enabled him to read there easily whenever disposed to do so. 
Between Clare and the window was the table at which his companions sat, their munching profiles rising sharply against the panes, while to the side was the milk-house door, through which were visible the rectangular leads in rows, full to the brim with the morning's milk. At the further end the great churn could be seen revolving, and its slip-slopping heard, the moving power being discernible through the window in the form of a spiritless horse, walking in a circle, and driven by a boy. For several days after Tess's arrival, Clare, sitting abstractly, reading from some book, periodical, or piece of music just come by post, hardly noticed that she was present at table. She talked so little and the other maids talked so much that the babble did not strike him as possessing a new note, and he was ever in the habit of neglecting the particulars of an outward scene for the general impression. One day, however, when he had been conning one of his music scores, and by force of imagination was hearing the tune in his head, he lapsed into listlessness, and the music-sheet rolled to the hearth. He looked at the fire of logs, with its one flame pirouetting at the top of a dying dance, after the breakfast cooking and boiling, and it seemed to jig to his inward tune, also at the two chimney crooks dangling down from the cotterel or crossbar, plumed with soot, which quivered to the same melody, also at the half-empty kettle whining an accompaniment. The conversation at the table mixed in with his phantasmal orchestra, till he thought, "'What a fluty voice one of those milkmaids has! I suppose it is the new one.' Clare looked round upon her, seated with the others. She was not looking towards him. Indeed, owing to his long silence, his presence in the room was almost forgotten. "'I don't know about ghosts,' she was saying but I do know that our souls can be made to go outside our bodies when we are alive." The dairyman turned to her with his mouth full, his eyes charged with serious inquiry, and his great knife and fork—breakfasts were breakfasts here—planted erect on the table, like the beginning of a gallows. "'What, really, now? And is it so, matey?' he said. A very easy way to feel them go," continued Tess, is to lie on the grass at night and look straight up at some big bright star, and by fixing your mind upon it you will soon find that you are hundreds and hundreds of miles away from your body, which you don't seem to want at all." The dairyman removed his hard gaze from Tess and fixed it on his wife. "'No, that's a rum thing, Christiana, eh?' To think of the miles I vamped the starlit nights these last thirty years, courting or trading or for doctor or for nurse, and never had the least notion of that till now, or filled my soul rise as much as an inch above my shirt collar. The general attention being drawn to her, including that of the dairyman's pupil, Tess flushed, and remarking evasively that it was only a fancy, resumed her breakfast. Clare continued to observe her. She soon finished her eating, and, having a consciousness that Clare was regarding her, began to trace imaginary patterns on the tablecloth with her forefinger, with the constraint of a domestic animal that perceived itself to be watched. "'What a fresh and virginal daughter of nature that milkmaid is!' he said to himself. And then he seemed to discern in her something that was familiar something which carried him back into a joyous and unforeseeing past, before the necessity of taking thought had made the heavens grey. He concluded that he had beheld her before. Where, he could not tell. A casual encounter during some country ramble it certainly had been, and he was not greatly curious about it. But the circumstance was sufficient to lead him to select Tess in preference to the other pretty milkmaids, when he wished to contemplate contiguous womankind. End of chapter 18